Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. Uh, you know, I heard a, a great story this week. I read it, rather. I had a, a letter from a prisoner who actually heard this in a chapel service, and I thought it was a great illustration. Let's see if I, I'll see if I can get it straight, but it seems like there was a man who was contending with a terrible smell in his house, and somebody finally suggested somehow that it had to do maybe with his septic tank, and so in trying to get somebody to work on it. The guy said, well, I can't be there this afternoon. Why don't you uh, uncover it for me so I can get, it, get to it first thing in the morning? And he, he did that and he looked and, he, and you know, his own assessment was, yeah, that's the problem. So he went in, took a shower, went to bed, got up in the next morning, went out to see uh, you know, what was going on and wait for the guy to get there. And he heard some strange noises coming from the septic tank. And he went over there, and a, during the night, a dog had fallen in there. And that poor dog was just, you know, swimming and sloshing and trying his best, you know, worn out and, of course, stinky and smelly and everything, you know, it, it was a pretty pitiful situation. And so he said, boy, I better do something about this. And he tried to reach down and, and uh, you know, help the dog, and the dog bit him. You, know, you can imagine the dog was scared and panicked and all, you know, anyway, he was in a state where he just bit the, bit the man who's trying to help him. So he thought, well, you know, I've got to, let me try something else. He stuck a ladder down in there. Maybe he can pull himself out. Maybe he can, you know, give him something to rest on. So the poor dog managed to get one paw, but he was so exhausted. He just finally, you know, he couldn't do anything. And so finally the man realized the only way I'm going to get this dog out of here, I'm going to have to get down in there. And uh, of course, everybody here is just imagining what that would be like. Anyway, so, so he did it. Finally, and the dog was so exhausted by this time, he didn't resist anymore. And, and so he finally was able to get, get underneath him and lift him out and climb out himself. And uh, I think the man was arriving uh, who was going to work on it and, and observed some of this. And so he got a hose, and they're hosing himself and the dog down. And then the, the man observed the dog beginning to lick the man, realizing what, uh, you know, beginning to realize what he'd done for him. But how many of you have already caught on that that's a pretty good picture of what the Lord's done for us? Because that's what we were. You know, what the Lord looks at this world and at this world system and the spirit that drives this world a whole lot differently than men do. It's as bad to him and maybe worse than that septic tank. And we're helpless. Born in Adam, we are helpless. Our first father was a sinner chose that pathway, chose to jump into the cesspool and, uh, you know, totally helpless. No matter what you do, you can't, you can't stick a ladder of the law down and say, climb out. That doesn't work. And yet how often when God tries to help us, do we bite and resist and fight and just totally, you know, don't understand what he's trying, the love that he's trying to extend to us. But what mercy to the Lord extended to to all of us to climb down into the cesspool, into the septic tank, and literally lift us out. Oh, praise God, I'll tell you. That's, uh, that's something to think about. But I, I just appreciate his mercy. And you know, Don spoke about Jesus and being willing to go to the death of the cross and surrender everything. Every part of his earthly life was completely given to the Father in total sacrifice for us, he didn't have to do that. He had glory with the Father before the world was, and he would have had it right on. But God had such a larger purpose in mind, and he had us in mind. And so in his mercy, uh, you know, he sent his son, and his son was willing to give up his life for us. And so that's, that's really a picture right there of what Paul is talking about in the entire first 11 chapters of Romans. It's the mercy of God to put... Because all men are, regardless of whether they're Jews or Gentiles, one of the issues he deals with, we're all in the same boat. We need exactly the same salvation, and it's entirely based on mercy. Well, then the question becomes, and this is what Paul is answering from the beginning of chapter 12 till about the middle of chapter 15, is, okay, what does that mean for us? 
what's our place? What's our responsibility? What is the proper response to what God has done? Uh, you know, we're, we're a little bit uh, further beyond the dog that licked the master's, or the, not his master, but licked the man's hand. But you know, there's a response that God is looking for. And I believe God has called us to that. And I, while I thank God for the glory that will be, I believe there's things he's called us to hear that flow directly out of what he has done for us. And that's what Paul is dealing with in this scripture. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy. See, that's what it is connected back to. In view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, as, as a living sacrifice, the Greek says, holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual or reasonable act of worship. And, uh, you know, Jesus was a sacrifice, wasn't he? You know, in the Old Testament, when there was, there was sin to be taken care of, what, what did they do under the law? They offered a sacrifice. Well, what happened to the sacrifice? It was killed, wasn't it? Sacrifice is something that has to die. There is something that has to die. And, of course, Jesus then became the ultimate sacrifice. As we know, the bulls and goats couldn't do anything, but it was pointing in faith to what was coming, what God was going to provide, the lamb that God was going to provide for the sin of the world. And so, but, but the sacrifice has to die. But now you've got a strange thing. It sounds, sounds kind of weird. How can a sacrifice be living? A living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Jesus said, if anyone's going to follow me, let him do what? Well, there's something before that. Deny himself. He must not an option. He must say no to self. See, this is the thing that we're, be, we're called to be saved from. There's no way you can sort of pacify self and allow self to live and sort of redirect self into religious activity and accomplish what God is after. God has got, the only way we can become what God has called us to be is for self to die. There just isn't any way. Deny self. Say no to self. But it's not just a negative, it's a yes to something else. But it's take up your cross. All right, there's another word in there in one of those, one of those passages. In Luke 9, take up your cross daily. So this becomes a way of life. That's what he's saying. You want to follow me? This is the way of life to which I have called you. There is a cross. There is a death that, that I have called you to die daily. Praise God. And I'll tell you, he says, the one, that's, the one that's out to save his life, the one that's trying to preserve self, is going to what? What's, what's the consequence of that? You lose it. But the one who loses his life will, for how long? For eternity. Praise God. What a deal. We give up something, as the, as the missionary once said, we, we cannot keep to gain what we cannot lose. So that's, that's a pretty good deal to me, and that's the mercy of God. But, oh, I'll tell you, self is so, well, it's just self. I mean, it's embedded in us. It's what we are. It's how we think. It's how we live and how we react. And I'm, I'm more and more conscious of just how incredibly embedded yeah. all of that is in us. We don't have to think about it. If somebody says something cross to you, do you have to think, now, what sh how should I respond to that? Well, let me think here. Uh, well, I could, you know, you just, you just automatically fire back. Why? Because it's what we are. It's how our, how our, my, how our brains are wired. My God, if we're going to be what he's called us to be, something's got to change. Praise God. But here is how, I mean, in this passage particularly, Paul tells us what our part is. He gives us a picture of how, what that looks like, not just in some little mystical relationship between me and Jesus in the sky, but in a practical, in practical living. He gives example after example after example of what this Christian life is about and how it looks 
That is what God is seeking to reproduce in us. What, the, what does that look like? How does that you know, compare with the way we are naturally? But then, thank God, he gives us a, a wonderful pattern of how that happens. Oh, I'm so glad he just doesn't dump all this and say, all right, now here's what I expect you to be. Go for it. No, his, his plan is so much wiser because we're, we're so much like that dog. A ladder doesn't do us any good. We need somebody to pull us out and clean us off. Praise God. And that's what he has set himself to do. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer. There's a definite presentation of ourselves to God. I mean, this is something, you know, I, I kind of looked up some of these words in the Greek just to refresh my brain. I don't often do that, but uh, I, I thought, you know, well, that's probably a daily kind of thing. That's like a repeated. No, there is a definite, that is a, a t the tense of the verb there is an act. I tell you, I believe there's a point in time when God has to reveal to us what our place is, and there is a surrender. And I think sometimes we come to the Lord. I'm not going to try to theologize this and say it's this way or it's that way and teach some second experience or any of that stuff. This is just a fact. There's a point in time when God reveals, you belong to me. Your only reasonable response to what I've done for you is to give yourself completely to me so that I own you. I, I, you're at my disposal. And that's, uh, that's exactly what this means, to present, to, to put ourselves at God's disposal. Say, Lord, I have, I have, apart from you, I'm a mess. All I'm doing is swimming in a septic tank, and, and it's going to lead to death in the end. But you have pulled me out. And God, I can't even clean myself off. I can't begin to be what you want. But oh God, I just put myself in your hands. Do what needs to be done. There is a surrender to him. There's a surrender to the Lordship of Christ. To where, and this is, this is something that is so definite. This is like a burn your bridges behind me kind of thing. This is not something where you're trying it out for a while to see how it works out. Because inevitably, you're going to run into something where self wants its way and God says no. And you're going to say, well, I choose self. If I can't have my way, I'm going to pack my little bags and, and leave here. I'll tell you, there is, a, there is such a vision. There is such a conviction that only God can produce in a heart where we're going to follow him no matter what. No matter, no matter what it looks like, no matter where the path leads, no matter what difficulties and challenges, no matter what the form of death that comes, we're able to see, just like Jesus did, there's a joy that's set before me. There's a hope that's real. I'll tell you, you can't manufacture this. This is a conviction that God has to give in the heart that it's worth everything to serve Jesus Christ. It's worth my life, and I give it to him. It's a done deal. Now, we may have to sort of, you know, remind ourselves of that. There is a reminder, but I'll tell you, that, that act, there's an act there of literally saying, Lord, I am yours. And where you and I are with respect to that may explain a lot of things in our lives. And I'll tell you what, once we pass that point and say, Lord, I, am, I have presented, I'm, I'm, I'm in I, I'm, I'm, I'm all the way in, Lord. I want your will. I want to, I want to live for your vision and your burden and your, your, your idea of what I need to become and just let the other go. I'm yours. And from this point on, I want to live, but it's not I but Christ that lives in me. See, there's the living sacrifice. You've got, you got both going on in Paul. I've, I've been crucified. Nevertheless, I live. A living death. But now it's different. Something's changed. It's no longer I that lives. It's Christ that lives in me. The life I live in the flesh, I'm still in the flesh, but, I, but now I'm living by a different set of principles. Not just, not just principles. A different force of life is inside of me. It's doing something. It has an effect. It makes a change that comes from the inside. I'll tell you, if you're in Christ, you're, you're different. There's something in here that has changed. You cannot, you cannot ever be the same. There is a change that takes place in the heart. That doesn't mean you don't, you're not tempted. doesn't mean you're not weak. doesn't mean you don't experience all these other things. But there is something in here 
that is eternal and it's real. And your motivation changes, your consciousness of sin changes. And that's what God has called us to. It's not I, but Christ that lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves me, loved me, and gave himself for me. Now what in the world kind of religion is it where we accept his gift of his, of his everything for us and we don't give everything to him? That doesn't make a bit of sense. That's why he calls it a reasonable service. Spiritual act of worship or reasonable act of worship. This is the only proper response. So now I have given myself to him. Now what? Now it says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Well, that's been a problem all along, hasn't it? You know, Paul describes those in Ephesians chapter 2 says, you were once dead in your, in your sins, you lived in them, you followed the ways of the world, you lived for the lusts of your flesh, you lived under the power that rules over the darkness of this world. That's where you were at when God's grace began to deal with you and pull you out. You were swimming in that septic tank. But God had mercy on you and he pulled you out when you could do nothing to help yourself. This is where, but, but here's the thing, there is constantly a pressure upon us and it is the most natural thing in the world for us to just simply go on being what we are naturally. That's the, that's the world we live in. Every, everything that feeds in, all, nearly everything that feeds into our mind. Where does the wisdom come from? Where does the motivation? Where is the, what is life about to people in this world? Does that affect anybody else here? Yeah. And the problem is we were, we've got flesh that still likes all of that. They're still in harmony with all of that. And, and, and so easy to just kind of go along with the crowd. I'll tell you, there's tremendous pressure when you're a young person. And we've all been there. The ones that aren't, anyway, the ones of us that are no longer there. We know what it's like. Man, you want to be accepted. You want to be liked by people. Well, what's the price of that? Most of the time, it's to compromise, it's to go their way instead of to be, to be different and to say, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going, to, I'm going to love, I'm going to be the right kind of person, but I want you and I need you. And I'm willing to, I'm willing to step out of the crowd. In fact, you can go right back to, uh, to, to verse 1, because he describes that living sacrifice as holy, doesn't he? What does the word holy mean? What's the real root meaning of the word holy? There is a separation. There is a devotion, a dedication of something to a particular purpose. You know, it's no longer just for the purpose that it once served. If you go out, and if a king goes out and takes somebody who's just lived a normal life and they've just been doing their own thing, and now he, he, he lays his hand on him and calls him into his service and puts a uniform on him and gives him responsibilities. He's been set apart. He's not just like his old buddies. God has called us to literally be his people separated from what this world is about. Now, that's not the same thing as saying we're holier than thou, stuck up kind of people at all. Because we know why. We, we know the foundation of that is mercy. We know we're not fundamentally better than anybody else or more deserving than anybody else, but God has shown mercy. And we bow to that mercy. We say, yes, Lord, I'm willing, to, I'm willing to be yours. I no longer belong to that. That's not what I'm about. I tell you, this is what, this is what it means to follow Jesus. I'm not my own anymore. I am bought with a price. The purpose of my life is not to just live and do my own thing. It's to glorify him. It's that my life should be pleasing. Isn't that another word that's used there? It's not just holy, separate unto him, but pleasing. My God, what a standard. Is what I do pleasing to God? Does God look at me and smile? And of course, if you're conscious at all of your weaknesses, you're saying, oh my God, no, he never smiles at me. He's constantly disgusted with me. No, I think God is a lot more gracious than that. But I'll tell you, he's looking at the heart. He's not looking at the perfection of where we're at at any given time because we're not there. But I'll tell you, if he sees a heart that is wanting 
pulling toward him, always getting, getting back on, you know, getting off course, but getting right back on and saying, Lord, I'm sorry, I, I, this is what my life is about. Cleanse me, clean me up, help me to go forward. God is pleased with that. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for a heart that says, God, I need you and I want you. Praise God. So this is, this is our part, is to present ourselves. That, it's a separate thing. It's a sacrifice. It's, it's something is dying. Something is living. That's the, that's the pattern of our life. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. What's the alternative? But be transformed. Now, that word in Greek is the word from which we get our word metamorphosis. You know what metamorphosis is? Well, yeah, that's the perfect example, is the caterpillar to the butterfly. God has built in the natural development of this creature. An amazing picture for us. Of something that just looks like a worm, might be a pretty worm, but it's still a worm. It's just crawling around on the ground and, and pretty vulnerable to, to birds and all kinds of things. But there comes a time when that little caterpillar begins to spin a cocoon. I tell you, there's a separation that takes place, isn't there? No longer is that uh, caterpillar able to go to caterpillar parties or whatever they do, you know, live life with his buddies. There's a, there's a real separation. And it's a place of confinement for a while, isn't it? You're not just free to run and do, but there's a, there, there's, that's not the end of the story. Thank God the, the cocoon is not a tomb. It's not a grave. It's not a, ca a coffin, I guess is the word I was looking for. It's something that is intended to take him to something that is glorious in the, in the, in the latter end. Now, of course, all of that happens instinctively, instinctively, but God wants us to enter into a metamorphosis that is with understanding. That we get what God is after. We, we may not see it all. We don't know what we will be, but we see enough to say, Lord, I'm, I'm yours. You have pulled me out of that septic tank. I belong to you. God, I want to be what you want me to be. And I'm willing to do what it takes to get there. I'm willing to live a life where it's going to be a place of confinement. I can't just run and do. I've got to sit there and I've got to allow the changes that God is seeking to bring about to happen in me. And there are changes on the inside. And I tell you, there comes a day, though, doesn't there, when that, when that cocoon begins to split. I haven't watched it. I, I'll probably get it quite a little bit wrong. Somebody can welcome to correct me. But I do know that there's not only that confinement, there's a place of struggling there for a while, isn't there? You got this, if you were to break the cocoon open right about the time it was, it was time for him to come out, you'd have this spindly little fat, juicy something or other that looks, looks ridiculous that wouldn't, wouldn't survive. There's some wonderful changes that have taken place. The form is there, but in the struggle of coming out of that, there is, there is a change that, is, that, brings, that, that actually accomplishes the purpose of becoming that, that butterfly that's able to just fly free in the sun and looks, looks so beautiful. The very struggle of coming out of that cocoon is what forces that fluid out in that spindle, in that crazy, juicy body, whatever you want to call it. All that fluid has to be forced out into those wings. And then, then when you get done, you've got a nice sleek little body and you've got these wings that are beautiful. And he comes out of that thing and it isn't long before he's in the air. What a picture of, what, of the metamorphosis that God is producing in our lives today. Folks, he's called us to something that isn't, doesn't make any sense to the world. I mean, if we're not going to be conformed to this world, we're going to have to be conformed to something different. There's a different set of values. There's a different set of everything. And how much religion in our day caters to human nature instead of confronting it and saying, I have come to deliver you. I have come to change you and make you something. God give us a vision. God give us something, a, a, an understanding that will enable us to have a commitment to, to something beyond what we have known. Because I believe God has called us to something and it's, 
I tell you, there, everything in religion, it seems like, and everything in, the, in our natural way of thinking is against this. But we got one who's for it, who is the Lord of heaven. And I am determined to stand by what his word says. I tell you, the devil attacks my, my confidence and my, you know, attacks me all the time. Who are you to say these, all these crazy things? Well, I'm nobody. But they're not my things. They're not my ideas. We're talking about the word of one who cannot lie. And God has called us to believe that there is one who can take things that are not and call them as though they were. Because he has the power to do it. Folks, that's what salvation is all about. It's a miracle. It's, doing, it's, it's submitting to God, allowing him to accomplish something we could never do. Well, praise God. I want to sign on, and I, don't, I, I just pray that there will be some folks that will go with me. And we can encourage each other along the way and, and have a true vision and not just go along. We need a revelation from heaven. We need a work of grace in the heart and we need some, need some changes to, to happen here. And that's what this is about in this particular verse. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Now, I'm going to go ahead and, and just uh, give you a couple of things from the Greek here. Interesting, the, the word be transformed. First of all, that is a present tense verb. Now, some of you will recall from other times when we made, a, made this point, a present tense verb in the Greek, the simple present, is what? It's a continuous thing, isn't it? So we're not talking about something that happens and then it's done. We're talking about be transformed as an everyday, right through your entire life kind of, exert, kind of thing. This is, this is a way of life in which change is constantly happening here and here. If I'm going to become someone who can walk in the rest of this passage and you read it, I'm going, there's going to have to be some changes. And it's going to have to start with the way I think. So that instead of acting and reacting according to the way the world dictates and the way my, my, the nature I was born with dictates, I'm going to start reacting like Christ. That's, that needs to be a way of life with us. If we're not living a life of sensitivity where God can actually talk to us and, and show us the degree to which self, self rules, then what else, what's, what's happening? Nothing. This has been the Midnight Cry Broadcast. If you would like a DVD or a CD of today's message in its entirety, please request it by program number. DVDs are $10 and CDs are $5. And for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your request to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. We invite you to join us again next week at the same time, and may God richly bless you until then.